Peace and Black Power, yo. This is your brother, Shaquem, my man, Hotep Arquette. Right back at you once again. Um, I wanted to talk about a subject. Um, somebody was actually probing me on Facebook earlier, and a lot of these questions normally do arise whenever I talk to people. One of the things that always comes up is... Is there a difference or a separation between the concept of Pan-Africanism versus what Pan-Africanism has actually evolved into as far as RBG is concerned? Now, anybody can chime in. You know, I'm, you know, looking at the comments, you know, waiting for individuals to actually ask certain questions. But in my studies... When I first began to uh, build on Pan-Africanism, when I first began to look at what Pan-Africanism meant, uh, studying the teachings of Marcus Garvey and, and reading the works of Marcus Garvey, I began to see that, you know, Pan-Africanism was a concept that all blacks must unite across the African diaspora. That uniting was not based upon any religious preference. That uniting wasn't based on any sort of political interest other than black first. That ideology wasn't limited or circumscribed to uh, just, you know, anything. Food, taste, you know, it, it, it's, it was just basically a race first philosophy and understanding that anybody can unite, whether or not you're Christian, whether or not you're Hebrew, whether or not you're Drew, Jew, whether or not you study any one of the ancient indigenous African spiritual systems. The basis of Pan-Africanism was solely and strictly centered around race first philosophy. That meant that Rev down the street who has all of those buildings, you know, and they go in there and clap every Sunday, he can be Pan-African as long as he understands that our people need to have a place in this society where they can actually come together and have a safe haven to build upon our ideas and build upon how we can restructure this society to take us from being last to being first. He can be Pan-Africanist. A lot of people like to note that Garvey was Pan-African. Garvey was Christian. So when you start to look at Marcus Garvey and what he began to achieve and what he thought about, he never did mention a... He never did mention religion as a fundamental factor in whether or not a person was Pan-Africanist. And you cannot show me in any one of Garvey's writings or any one of Garvey's interviews where he said that having an indigenous African belief system is the only method that you can use to determine yourself as being a Pan-African. Garvey didn't say that. Now, even when you begin to research the uh, uh, the African uh, liberation in 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 the in, in Africa, when you begin to look at the African liberation uh, theory and what happened, you see that a lot of those countries were Christians. Uh, a lot of those countries, you know, eat, we understand, you know, brothers like Ashwa Kwesi has given us. Uh, the history of Christianity and where it derived from and you know you have the oldest church in Ethiopia and Lelabala you know Brother Ashwa Kwesi uh, Brother Sarah Sutton said he has given us a lot of information pertaining to the origin of Christianity and we know that you know the origin of Christianity does reach back along the Nile Valley civilization that is irrefutable undisputable truth now Marcus Garvey, we know, did not say that you must have a certain political orientation in order to describe yourself as a Pan-African. Even sexual preferences. Now, I know some of you are going to get on this, and I disagree solely with 
homosexuality. It is something that is anti building the African family because that's our ultimate objective, especially in the South Carolina RBGs. So what I'm telling you is that there is nowhere in the writings of Garvey that he said a sexual preference is needed for you to be Pan-African. All he basically said is that the black woman and black man should have that mentality and to plant that seed that everything they do, everything they see, everything they believe, everything they hold on to, everything that they grasp and, and, and hold dear to them, all of the values, all of the customs, everything that they do should have a race first centered ideology in order for us to move forward from being last to being first. And I would love for somebody to, um, I would love for somebody to fight me on this. Now, what we have is an, is an offshoot of Pan-Africanism when you start looking at RBG, right? Because I consider myself RBG. So even though Marcus Garvey did not specify that homo, a homosexual cannot be a Pan-African in the RBG movement, we come out and we say that homosexuality is prohibited in our movement, right? So what we have actually done is we've taken the principles of Pan-Africanism, we've developed them and we cultivated it and we grew it into something that we know is going to tailor and suit what's going on in 2016. It's just like the Muslim tradition, right? In the Muslim tradition, they have Quran and they have Hadith, but they understood the Muslims today, especially in the, in the nation of Islam, they understood that Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam said in ancient Arab in, in, in his ancient times in Arabia, we know that the things that he quoted as far as hadith and the things that he did as far as Sunnah is not applicable today in 2016 because this is a new time and a new era. So the information has to be updated, right? So what we have done is in the RBG movement, we saw that there were some of the issues that Marcus Garvey faced back in the early, in the middle 1900s. These are not in totality the problems which we have today. And one of the oft -repeated exam often repeated examples is homosexuality, right? Now we just witnessed the unveiling of a new homosexual flag with a fist. Now, my biggest problem with the homosexual movement is not only does their lifestyle totally contradict the principles of Ma'at and as far as, you know, the spiritual system and which I hold dear to me, but let's even like move outside of that. Anytime you have a group of people who put their agenda or their preferences in front of being race first, they are cancerous to what we are trying to provide for our children and for our offspring when it comes down to defeating systematic racism. So now I've been in Black Lives Matter meetings before and a lot of you actually know that I have worked with, you know, Black Lives Matter after, you know, Michael Brown's you know, assassination and things of that nature. And a lot of us did because in the beginning before there was really like a defined organization of Black Lives Matter, we all got on social media and we placed those hashtags up on our, on our Facebook profiles and we placed those hashtags up on social media and we plastered it everywhere. So now what ended up happening is the homosexual agenda needed to find a place where they can actually put their objectives in and feed off of other people. That's like now, if you go to a, a Black Lives Matter meeting and you sit down, how is it that you can find in the line item agenda 
of things to be discussed, transgender bathrooms. So that's what you refer to as the bait and switch philosophy or the bait and switch ideology, right? That means that under the guise of Black Lives Matter, under the guise of, you know, fighting for systematic equality or fighting under the guise of eliminating racism, somewhere down the line, you see a line item that says that transgender bathrooms must find itself in this conversation. That's the same thing that politicians do when writing bills and writing legislation. And anybody who has just a basic understanding of how law goes, you know that when certain bills are drafted and certain legislation is drafted and it goes to Congress and it goes in front of the Senate and it goes in front of the House, you see that they have multiple line items in that bill. And what ends up happening is that you have certain people who, when you find a bill that's drafted for, let's just say, uh, criminal domestic violence, you have a, a bill that is introduced for tougher penalties for criminal domestic violence. And in the news and in the media, it talks about how this wonderful new legislation is being designed to penalize individuals who are convicted for criminal domestic violence. And on face value, that sounds good because we understand fundamentally, fundamentally that is what's needed. So nobody in their right mind would actually vote against a piece of legislation that seeks to enhance the penalty for someone who's been convicted of criminal sexual conduct or criminal domestic violence. However, what politicians do is they sneak in this legislation, these underlying policies that might say, okay, well, in this bill that we drafted, we're going to sneak something in that is going to give um, the city access to another $200 million in taxpayer dollars to build a new golf course in a white community. So now what effectively happened is that on the surface, you're seeing people say, hey, we want legislation that is going to increase the penalty for criminal sexual conduct or criminal domestic violence. But in that piece of legislation, there's something for a new $100 million golf course in an all-white community. So now the politician is left with his hands tied because if he votes against that bill for the increasing of uh, the penalty for criminal sexual conduct, his colleagues are going to look at him as if he did something wrong and, the, and whoever's running against him is going to paint him as being insensitive to the needs of the victims of criminal sexual conduct, but in, but in all totality, he has no beef with that. His beef is for the $100 million plan to introduce a new golf course into a white community. So that's what you call the bait and switch agenda. And that's what Black Lives Matter has been doing to us. So on face value, the concept of Black Lives Matter is good. The concept. Because you're saying essentially that we want access to, um, we want access to, you know, live in a society to where we can move freely. We want access to live in a society to where we can make our own decisions without being hindered, without being obstructed by clans men and clans women who are making these laws and making these policies that seek to, you know, destroy us and to stop us from doing something that is equivalent to self-determination. But you have the homosexuals who are coming in and they're saying, oh yeah, we want that also. But by the way, in order for us to fight with you for the cause of police brutality, we need you to back us in our agenda for gay marriage. And see, this is what's happening and this is what's messing up the minds of our people. Now, in the RBG movement, we are an African-centered movement. That means that there is a lot of hesitancy and we are really hesitant to embrace certain 
spiritual ideologies that are lacking in a significant African origin. So if I have someone who, you know, is a Muslim, a Sunni, Shia, Nation of Islam, whatever, Hanafi, Hanbali, whatever. If we have somebody who studies these particular religious ideologies, uh, Christianity, you know, Hebrew, whatever, we are hesitant to embrace them because we understand that these ideologies are detrimental to the uniting of African people across the diaspora. Now, I'm going to prove something to you. I love my Hebrew brothers. I love a lot of them, even though they don't love me. Why? Because they say that anyone who professes out of their mouth that they are African, they are an enemy to them. So how is it that we can have a true understanding of what Pan-Africanism means when we have these particular religious ideologies that are making us fight with one another. They are keeping us from embracing one another. They are keeping and prohibiting us from moving forward and doing business with one another. And it's all because of these religious waverings that we're having. I personally believe that we should be in control of our own institutions, our own institutions of learning, our own political institutions. We should be in control of our own destiny. That's self-determination. How do you think Africa actually won its independence with its numerous countries? It wasn't through the filing of paperwork. I love my Morris family. I'm friends with a lot of Moors brothers and sisters. However, when you start to tell me that we can file paperwork and we're supposed to use these, these words of, 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 of law that will allow us to escape out of the jurisdiction of the United States but still be staying on this land, you're telling me a lie. And when you go and you study the history of African revolution, and when you go and study the history of African warfare, somebody show me one territory that's won its independence by pleading to the one who has that land currently occupied to let them go because of a status symbol. Somebody please show me. You can't tell me that we're going to win independence by flying a flag of Morocco. You can't tell me that. Somebody please tell me how I can actually win my independence by walking in a courtroom, handing a judge a piece of paper that's saying, that says that I profess my sovereignty here in front of this judge, in front of this court. Tell me how that submission of paperwork is really going to give me the privilege of being able to establish something here without interference from the European. Don't just give me these examples of you beating a traffic ticket. I don't want to spend all day, hours and hours and hours reading and researching on how I can beat a traffic ticket. I haven't had a traffic ticket in almost 15 years. I just don't speed. That's it. Tell me how we can come together and build institutions of learning. This is what the red, black and green is all about. Tell me how we can actually begin to understand and build our own political party so that we can assist in governing each other. Tell me how we can, you know, begin to do community control patrols so that we can help alleviate crime and how we can actually assist our people in feeling safe in the neighborhoods that they live in because we know that they have been subjected to poverty and tyranny. Tell me how we can come together as a people to support businesses and how we can make a standard of living increase amongst ourselves. This is what Pan-Africanism and RBG is all about. So just remember, just because you are Pan-African and just because you have an ideology of race first, it does not necessarily mean that you will be accepted as RBG.
Now, a lot of people, like I said, are going to disagree with what I say, but RB, RBG to Pan-Africanism is like the Tea Party to the Republican Party. Now, y'all going to laugh when I say this, but I'm going to say it again. RBG to Pan-Africanism is almost similar to the Tea Party to the Republican Party. And I'm explaining this why. Now, when you speak to a brother or sister who really reps RBG, you will find out that we almost have zero tolerance for the political process in the United States. It's almost a zero tolerance philosophy because we have gotten to the point to where we see and we understand and we have been hurt and we have been beat down by the political process for so long. It seems as though by us engaging in it, we're actually spinning our wheels. Now, Donald Trump says something last the other day that was very interesting. He actually asked black people, what do you have to lose? He said the unemployment rate is sky high. The job rate is it, the, the job rate. Um, but the, 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 the jobs in the black communities are low. The educational system is beat down and is falling. He said all of these things are crumbling. He said that the African American community is crumbling when you start looking at the numbers. He said, what do you have to lose? Now, it's sad that certain Negroes don't understand what he was really saying. But we don't want to vote for him. But what we've been saying in the community to the, uh, to the black people in America has been the same thing for many years. What do you have to lose? Why do you continue to put your trust in a Democratic Party that for years has not helped to alleviate crime, for, for years has increased uh, incarceration between black men and women that for years has actually taken our votes and as soon as the election process is finished with, they have only sought to do the same things. Our question is, what do we have to lose? That's our question for you today. What do you have to lose? And it shouldn't take Donald Trump to ask you that question. What do you have to lose? We've been asking you this question for many, many, many years. A race first philosophy alone is good, but it has to be deeper than a race first philosophy. It almost has to come to a philosophy of race only. Because we have been so far beat down in this, in this, in this system and in society, we cannot just have a race first a lot philosophy. We have to have a race only philosophy. And that's the difference between the RBG movement and the Pan African movement. We are still our brothers and sisters, but in the RBG system, we have to understand that we need to adopt, to adopt a race only philosophy so we're just building upon what marcus garvey has said we're just taking his words and applying it to 2016 we're not doing something different but we're kind of like bringing in or we're streamlining the process we're streamlining it right and that's exactly what we have to do let me see Somebody, oh, the sister. Okay, peace, queen. She said, my five pennies. There are already too many divisions as is, RBG. Pan-Africanists, Pan-African, Black Nationalists, all use the same colors. Then there's Nwapi, Nwapu, NGE, the metaphysical, our light beings. Let me click see more. The conscious community, or lack thereof, has more denominations than the church. Peace, peace, queen. Um, and that's true. And a lot of times, this is just a topic that we're going to have to deal with division, right? We're going to have to deal with divisions and our understanding of what type of 
avenue that we need to take in order to succeed. My thing is this. What I always tell my brothers and sisters who are in the movement here, you know, we have to take a stand on what we believe in and we move and we move forward. I I don't really if people want to move forward with us, then hey, I'm all for it. If you don't want to move for us, guess what? Then you're just gonna have to get rolled over. Because at the end of the day, by me sitting here and debating with or uh, uh, trying to get five percenters on the same track or uh, trying to get Christians on the same track or uh, trying to get Nwapians on the same track. And some of these people are. However, it's so many people out there with fresh minds who are willing to listen and who are willing to learn by you sitting back and talking to these Nwapians and trying to get them on the same page or trying to get five percenters on the same page. By the time you finish spinning your wheels messing with these people, we could have been out in the street going and grabbing 100 or 150 people who really don't have any understanding of what consciousness needs to be. And this is how we can grow our own community. So I tell my people a lot of time, we don't even need to waste time with these people who have these divisions. Why am I going to sit back? Uh, uh, one of the more brothers have been trying to get me <clears throat> to talk to him and to sit down. And this is a good brother. And I know he's probably watching, but he's been trying to get me for a little while to come and sit down and talk to him about what they believe and, and, and iron out our differences. But this is the thing. Why am I going to iron out my differences with some people who I know that is not going to do anything for. And this time that I'm sitting here talking to these people about our differences, I could be in the streets in downtown Charleston <clears throat> with some guys who shooting and killing each other <clears throat> and stabbing each other and trying to get them to understand fundamentally what we believe and what we have to offer. So I don't even really want to wait. I, I can, I'm not going to go and attend a universal cipher with some five percenters and they sitting here trying to argue with me on one of their degrees talking about the holy city the holy city is in mecca where the original man was first formed when the planet was first founded if i know that you believe the holy city is mecca i might tell you a couple times that your degree is wrong and i'm going to tell you that you need to go and search and research the now valley civilization and the history of the now valley and i'm going to tell you that the that, you know, man was not found in Arabia. But if you don't believe me, I'm not going to argue with you because I got 10 or 15 more people that I could be spending my time with talking to them and getting them to understand that the origin of man was along the Nile Valley. And this is where our people actually came from. So, um, okay. She said, race first means to me black first. Divisions aside, right. We don't have to be buddy-buddy to work, right? Sustain and build a community together, right? Just a common goal. All right, few, and that's that's 100% right, Queen. <laughs> Definitely. So, you know, um, we don't all have to be on the same page in order to make process progress. <laughs> and I believe that the first step is going out into your community and reaching the people. <laughs> Do not waste your time begging people and talking to people who already have their mind made up. If people have their mind already made up, leave them alone. Go and get the people who want to listen. Why do you think we go out in the community weekly and go and feed the people? That's what we do. When you see us in these pictures and you see us going in these poor communities, we are going out there trying to feed the people, the homeless people, giving them food, giving them clothes. I'm not sitting here wasting my time going down to the Morris Science Temple meeting and going building with them. That's a waste of time because people, when people already have their own. See, my mom always used to tell me you need to pick and choose your battles carefully and pick and choose your battles wisely. I know that everybody is not going to agree with my ideology and my philosophy, but I understand that my philosophy and my ideology is pro-black. I'm black first. We want to establish our own institutions of learning. We want to establish, which includes our educational system. We want to establish our own financial system. We want to establish our own political system. 
So I need to go and find people who I can build with, who can fundamentally understand the message that I'm relaying. And they say, you know what, Shaquem? This is what we want to do. Let me grab hold of this information and I'm willing to roll with you. That is how we build our army and we increase our numbers. We do that by reaching out to people who have not been really tainted. And if they have been tainted, they've always been questioning what they believe for so long, they're willing to lend you an ear. But we cannot get so bogged down in these firefights and these intellectual masturbation arguments that, you know, we're talking, we're having, you know, fruitless discussions and you know that you're not even going to get this person to agree with you. So I say, if you don't, if you're not able to get a person to agree with you and what you stand for, go find somebody else. And like I said, we got to respect other people and what they trying to do and what they believe. Just like I put up a post the other day <clears throat> when I was out there feeding the homeless people. And I still got the care package right here because this was my last one. But in this package, this care package, I had a box of condoms. And I still get it. This is my last one because I saved the last one. And I was, pack and I was passing this out. And... And then it, you know, I normally put in, or I do have some condoms. And I got these, um, they give these out free at the clinic. So if anybody is ever interested in doing the same thing, you can go to your clinic and they will give you a free bag of condoms. So the thing is, when I put together, <clears throat> when I put together these little um, packets to give the homeless people, you know, a little washcloth and, you know, dial soap and all of that. So when I give this stuff out to these people, I always throw in, a, a, um, I throw in some condoms. So when I was out there, I had a Christian lady. She said, she said, young man, and you know she was a sister. So with all due respect, I'm gonna be respectful. For, I'm gonna be respectful to her because that's a black woman. So you know we want to make, and then she was an elder. So she told me, she said, you know what, brother. She said, I see that you always out here. And she said, I always see that you, you know, we're helping the people. She said, but I disagree with the fact that you're promoting promiscuity amongst homeless people who already have addictions with drugs, addictions with alcohol. They have, you know, they are basically living a life of sin already. She said by you handing out condoms is like you actually saying, here, I promote you going and living a life of sin. I understand you're homeless, but I'm just going to go ahead and advocate what you're doing and, you know, by you giving condoms. She said that I should be promoting, if they're not married, for them to abstain from sex because that addiction to sex is actually fueling their mind. Uh, I would just, well, okay, she said that addiction to sex or by them having sex is distracting them from utilizing the proper methods to get themselves out of homelessness. So it's kind of like, you know, clouding their minds are real cloudy. So as I sat back and I listened to her, I totally disagree with her because... As I told her, I said, I felt that whether or not I come and tell a grown person that they should be having sex, it's too late. These people are 30 and 40 years old. How can I sit there and tell a grown, a grown adult that you shouldn't be having sex? So my thing is to keep them from, you know, getting STDs and the making babies and these babies have to be born into a life of poverty. I said, I go ahead and I go and get a big old box of condoms from the clinic and I go ahead and put these in the um I put these in the in the um in these little um uh packets I hand out. So you know we had a discussion about it and it was clear that she wasn't going to understand what I said. So I just went ahead and I left it alone because there's no reason for me to argue with this lady 
And to go back and forth with her, when I understand this lady is probably 65 years old, she has her mind made up. There is no reason for me to try to change her way of thinking after so long. So I'm going to continue to keep putting condoms in these packets that I'm giving to homeless people. If she doesn't like it, so what? We just disagree. That doesn't mean that I love her any less. That just means that I understand the mentality of the church by us actually being in the church. We know what the church stands for. We understand that they are anti-fornication. We understand that they have a philosophy of if you're not married, you shouldn't even have sex. I understand the age bracket that she's in. So I understand her philosophy. So instead of me engaging in a firefight with her verbally, I just understood where she was coming from. I understood the era that she was brought up in and I understood the church. So therefore, I don't have any beef with her. But, however, I know that in the community here, we are going to give the people what they need in order for them to grow and develop. My thing is, <coughs> the reason why our communities aren't growing the way how they should is we have to show we're not showing the people that we really truly care about them we have to find ways to meet the needs of the community before we just start going in the community talking this black power stuff i can go in the community all day and scream black power and you know and, and the hell with the white man and we need to have our own and we need to do this and we need to do that. That sounds good. But what I've learned from being in the community and having an organization is that when you can go out and successfully meet the needs of the people, when you can go and say, hey, you know, how you doing today, sir? You know, grow a bond with these people. Let them know that you care. Don't just go in the communities pushing your agenda. Let them know that you truly have their best interests in mind. That allows you to connect with these people as being human beings. If I go out in the hood and I go out where the homeless people are, are at and I hear them talking about football, I don't go and say football is a game that's used to design, is used to keep our people distracted from the real issues, and it's about sport and play. And I don't just go beating down these homeless people because they're having a conversation on the bench about football. That's stupid. I go and I talk to them about the game that they love, and I might say, yeah, you know, did you see the game Sunday? Yes. Who's your favorite team? And you start trying to find ways that you can connect with these people. To show them that you're actually a real human being. Even if you don't like something that they like, still try to talk to them and understand why is it that they like what they like. You know, we have to grow a bond with these individuals. And, and, and until we can understand this small concept, we're never going to grow and the numbers that we're supposed to grow because we're not making a connection with the people. You just can't go out there and say black power. Yeah, they can say black power. But what do you know about this person? Do you know about this person's family? Do you know about this person's relationship? Do you know how this person thinks? Do you know what this person's like? I know people right now who sleep out in the bench. I know exactly what type of food they like to eat. I know who likes church's chicken. I know who likes Taco Bell. I know who likes pizza. I know who likes um, uh, Red Bull energy drinks. I know who want water. I know what type of water they want. I know if they want spring water. I mean, I know everything. I know what type of hand sanitizer certain people like. I understand. I un When I go and I talk to these homeless people and I see them every week, I know exactly what they like and what they don't like. And the reason why I do that is because I want to show them that I'm not just out here somebody trying to proselytize them or somebody who has a hidden agenda of getting these people on board with me and SCRBG. I'm trying to show these people that there is a group of brothers and sisters out here who really care for you. Ask them, you know, how many children do you have? How old are your children? You know, do they go to school? Are they in college? Sit down and have conversations with these people. And this is how you gain support in the community. That's right. Um, 
Cardo, you said you got to find ways to understand to overstand. And that's the truth. If somebody comes to me, if somebody comes to me and, okay, let's go back to when I was in prison. When I was in prison, I used to have a lot of brothers who would come up to me and say, man, big man, you's a savage. You know, all you want to do is watch BET all day and, and go and, and, and play basketball in the, in, the, in the gym and sign up for flag football and all that stuff. And big man, you a savage. That's a, they, used to call, they used to call me savage. Oh, big man, that's all you, man, you eating all that stuff. And they used to just beat me down. So, of course, I didn't want to listen to anything that they had to say because the brothers in the prison system used to beat me down. So I didn't want to hear that conscious stuff. I want to get my shit off. I want to go in the kitchen and steal apples and steal oranges to make wine and all kind of stuff. I didn't want to listen to these dudes. They sitting here telling me that the black man is God and this and that. I don't give a damn who God is. The God is whoever has all that chicken in the back in the kitchen that I can go and steal and bring out in the unit and go and sell in the unit. That's my God. I don't care about all this Allah and, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said this in the Quran. I didn't give a damn about none of that. I wanted to go and steal something out of the kitchen to bring back and to sell for some stamps. It wasn't until I had a brother who used to sit me down and always talk to me and talk to me about my family and talk to me about, you know, some of the hardships that I was having. And he would come and make a, and made and establish a friendship with me. And it wasn't until then that I really sat back and I listened to him because I gave him the respect because I didn't think that he had an ulterior motive. I just thought he was just a cool brother. And that's what we need to do when we start going in these streets and going and talking to these people. And like Brother Irv just said, collaborate with like-minded goals. That's the thing. Collaborate with these individuals who, have, who are on the same wavelength as you. Go out and talk to these brothers in the street. That's why every community, every, every I would say, RBG chapter or whatever, any sort of African centered group, you must go and establish a bond with the community. You can't, there's no reason for you to call a meeting. If you can't, if you call a meeting right now and you only have five people show up, that means you need to be in the community. If you have a meeting and I say, okay, I'm gonna do a meeting and I want a meet a community meeting. And you only have four or five people that show up and these are the same four or five people. That means you need to be in the community. That's all. We got to be in the community 24-7. These people need us. And they will listen to you. All you have to do is show these people that you care. That's it. Uh, I know I've been talking. I've been talking so much. Um, but... I just love actually, you know, giving a word of wisdom to my family. I love talking to y'all, and I love all of y'all. And I know, you know, there's certain things that I do that people disagree with, and there's certain things that I do I don't even agree with. But at the end of the day, what makes us a good people is we can still have our disagreements, and we can still embrace each other. That is what's important, and that's what we need to hold on to. We need to stop doing the sneak dissing on Facebook. The sneak dissing on Facebook only causes confusion, discord, and it causes a lot of hurt, pain, frustration, and agony. And it only grows the wedge even more wider in the conscious community because we are making these slick references to other people and we know exactly what we're talking about. So my challenge for you today is to love each other, to understand each other, to help each other, and to build each other up. That is the only way that we're going to be successful. The brother said disagree without being disagreeable. That's it. Make sure you go in your community at least once a week. Make a commitment. Go in the community once a week. And I'm a, and I'm a, let me explain something like this. A lot of people... When they inbox me or they talk to me and they say, Shakim, I want to start, you know, I want to start something in my city. But then 
they're going to say, you know, the reason why I haven't done such is because I don't have anybody that is on the same page or the like mine. Uh, I don't have someone to do this. Or I don't have somebody to do that. I understand, and it's very difficult. <laughs> now, if you notice and you go back on my Facebook page, when I first started out in the community, a lot of times you would only see me. And it wasn't because I was self-centered and it wasn't because I was ag arrogant or egotistical because a lot of people have falsely made those claims. Oh, Shaquem, he wants all the glory and he wants all of the fame and this and that. No, I was in the community all by myself because that's I was the only person that I knew that would actually go out. So I didn't wait on anybody else. I went by myself. And then once I started going out by myself, I started meeting other individuals who said, you know what? That brother's dedicated. I, I'm willing to do the same things. So I started meeting brothers like Kevin and I started meeting brothers like Talim and the brothers and sisters who we work with now. And that is what helped us grow as a community. But if if you have to, if if your desire is is enough to where you will do something and do it by yourself, then start off by yourself. I took a grill, I went and bought 40, 40 or 50 hamburgers from Walmart for like $15 or $20. I went and bought two packs of hot dogs, some hamburger buns and all of that, and found a couple females with some EBT, and I started going in the hood. That's it. I started going in the neighborhood by myself at first. I didn't make excuses about, oh, well, I need these people to come with me, and why do black people um, don't want to come in the community? That's that's a cop out. I didn't wait for nobody to come and help me in the community. I started doing it myself. And then the people who are so arrogant to say, oh, Shaquem, it was just arrogant and he's won all the glory. No, it was because I was the only person who was doing it at first. And then I got the crew that came, but I had to show that I was willing to stand up and do what I wanted to do and what I said I was going to do by myself and without anybody else involved, I knew that this was something that I had to do, and that's what I did. So anybody who is having trouble starting off in your city or in your community, and you feel that you don't have the people behind you, do it yourself. Like I said, I could go feed, I could go feed 50 or 60 people in the neighborhood for like $30 and go and print out a couple of pamphlets or something and go take a flag out. And I can go and talk to a bunch of people and go and just go and get a grill and just let the community know you care. Let the community know that that, you know, we do have individuals out here who want to see better and want to do something. Don't be scared to go alone. You don't need a group of people to go with you. Do it yourself. And if you take pictures, don't listen to anybody saying, oh, are you taking pictures for likes and all of that? Don't listen to that rhetoric. When people see that you have someone who's consistent, then that encourages them to grow on and to say, hey, I want to join on to what you're doing. And they'll place that inbox to you. They'll place that phone call to you. Don't sit back and listen to somebody saying, oh, they're doing this for likes and all of that. Because you can get more likes posting pictures of naked women all day. So it ain't about the likes. I can go and post a picture with some females twerking and stuff, some twerk videos, and get likes if I just wanted likes. So it ain't about likes. It's about getting people on the same page and letting people know that you have a certain energy that is going to help them. So that's basically all I want to say. I'm finished running my mouth. Uh, I thank everybody for tuning in. I just wanted to get that off my chest. And like I said... Um, one of one of the things that I want to leave y'all with is this. In 2009, when I 2009, 2010, because I was in half when I left federal prison, I left prison as a man on a mission. And one of the things that I said, the first thing that I said when I got out of prison, the first thing I said that I was gonna do was establish a relationship with my daughter. That was the first thing I said I wanted to do. The second thing that I said that I wanted to do after I established a relationship with my daughter, I said that I want to be the resurrection of Malcolm X in America. 
That was the first book that was given to me in my journey on a knowledge to sell. But I knew before I can embark on a journey to help liberate my people, I knew that I had to have my home first. I had I knew that I had to have my living situated, my living standards, or uh, my living, uh, 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 my living, my living, my house in order. Put it like that. I knew I had to have my house in order. We need to help these brothers that's coming out of prison. The reason why brothers come out of prison and they go back is because a a lot of times they can find a job. <laughs> But a lot of time, it's peer pressure, right? Because, I mean, you can find it. Anybody almost can find a job. It might not be something that you like, but it's still a job. A lot of time, brothers come back is because of peer pressure. They, they have to go back in the same environment that actually uh, led them or uh, moved them towards a direction of criminal or illicit activity. So when a brother comes home from prison and you go back in the same community that you were selling drugs in, you go back to the same community where you were slaying a crack in, when you come back to the same community where you used to rob, where you used to hustle, it's almost like a crack addict saying that he's recovering, but yet and still has crack pipes laying around his house. It doesn't work. What we have to do is make sure we can catch a lot of these young, powerful warriors coming out of prison and we embrace them. That is what we need to do. Now, we can stop it on the front end by going into schools and helping the children, but we can't neglect the back end. We got to start helping these young brothers and sisters when they come out of prison. I saw the sister Nisi X talk about you know, helping out the political prisoners. There's a lot of brothers in the system now with a lot of wisdom. I write a brother now named Vance Hicks. He's in uh, he's in uh, the federal prison in Estelle. He's a 5% of knowledge born God or law. But he's in federal prison in, uh, Edge, in Estelle, South Carolina. I did a lot of time with that brother. I still write him to this day. Matter of fact, I don't even have to write him because they got an app called Coralinks in the federal system to where you can just, I can just sit here and type, and type, 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 and just send it to him like that. So I don't even have to write a letter now because I use Coralinks. But these individuals in the prison system, the ones who are about knowledge itself, they have a nice, a beautiful information source that we can tap into. They have all day to study. They have all day to read. They have all day to write. They have all day to study. If you can, if you ever have a problem with anything as far as legal, as far as, you know, question, wisdom or guidance, listen, you got brothers in prison who are adept. These brothers are really sharp. We just have to tap in to that resource so that we can help make a change. So I'm going to leave y'all the way how I came. Peace and black power. Shaquem Ahmed Hotep Arquette, SCRBG. Peace. I'm out.